Welcome to the Brain Warriors Way podcast. I'm Dr. Daniel Amen. And I'm Tana Amen. Here we teach you how to win the fight for your brain to defeat anxiety, depression, memory loss, ADHD, and addictions. The Brain Warriors Way podcast is brought to you by Amen Clinics, where we've transformed lives for three decades using brain spect imaging to better target treatment and natural ways to heal the brain. For more information, visit amenclinics.com. The Brain Warriors Way podcast is also brought to you by BrainMD, where we produce the highest quality nutraceutical products to support the health of your brain and body. For more information, visit brainmdhealth.com. Welcome to the Brain Warriors Way podcast. Well, I'm so thrilled today. We have a special guest. We have Denny Salisbury, who I met when I was with Chloe at a wilderness survival retreat, which you thought I was crazy to go on. Um, but I'm actually really happy I went because meeting Denny was one of the highlights of the trip. Um, you know, I actually enjoyed sleeping in the dirt and building shelters and doing all that stuff. I know you would not have liked that. But Denny's story really caught me. Um, it just tugged at my heartstrings. I called you immediately afterwards. And I wasn't expecting it. And it was just one of those stories. And we both have a very special place in our hearts for veterans. Denny is a veteran. And so first we want to say hello, Denny. Hello. How are you? I am doing wonderful. Just had surgery, so I'm healing up from that. But Well, we're happy that at least you are able to talk to us and share with us today. Um, we want to sort of go into... Um, you know, your story and what happened. And I called Daniel and I was talking a hundred miles a minute and I'm like, this is, this is why we do what we do. I mean, every now and then, um, I love that he doesn't say no to me often when he does, I'm usually in shock. Um, but I called him and I'm like, look, this is why we do what we do. And I usually reserve, you know, an opportunity to bring someone in under my wing, you know, at least once a year and your story, just, you were that person. So I loved your story. It was amazing and well, sad, tragic, but it's why we do what we do. And so can you start by talking to us and, you know, tell us a little bit about, you know, your military experience. You were in the Marines, correct? Yes. How yes. old, how, how old were you when you went in? Um, so I, I went in right out of high school. So January of 2006, I joined boot camp, and that was in San Diego. Okay. And I flew down there and it was, I mean, it was a shock. I didn't really know. <laughs> didn't know what you were getting yourself into. <laughs> I had that same feeling when I went to basic training in 1972. It's yeah. like, what? I know you told me, you said you were all excited to go. And then all of a sudden you had someone screaming that you were you know, calling you maggot and like telling you what to do. I'm I like, just... that's not what I expected. <laughs> right, right. It was a surreal feeling because if you've flown into San Diego, there's a big uh, rappel tower right next to the airport that says USMC right down the side. Right. This is the thing I, I had to see when I flew in, so it was... So you were at Pendleton then? Yes. Pendleton. That's right near us. Yes. Yeah. It's beautiful out there. It really is, until you probably go to basic training. It probably is great. Um, so you ended up right away going to Iraq. Is that where you went? Um, so actually... Uh, there's quite a bit of training before you get to Iraq. Okay. I had a, I had a full year's worth of training. Okay. Which I thought was, you know, very good training. We, we really trained hard. Uh, I spent three years in boot camp. I mean, three months in boot camp. I'm sorry. And then uh, we went to, or I went to school of infantry, and then got shipped out to two seven, the unit, mm -hmm. 29 Palms. Okay. So I, I spent a little over six months out there training, and it was just preparing for war and that's it's ironic because when i was in high school I, I didn't think i was going to join the military but then 2001 september 11th and it was just for me it motivated me enough to to join the military so i mean i knew i had to do it and so when i did the testing actually i scored quite high and i could have done whatever i wanted to in the military but i chose to go into the infantry for the marine corps and i my family is a history of being in the military so i mean it just felt natural. And, it, uh, it's really interesting. You mentioned something, and I'm, I'm not I'm not bashing the military by any means because I think that you know the guys who join all 
men and women who join the military and serve our country, they're our heroes. I mean, I actually, police officers, soldiers, I mean, I look up to all of them. Um, but what, what bothers me a little bit is we do do a really good job of marketing and motivating people to join. But I don't think as a country we do a very good job, jump in if you think I'm wrong, of supporting them afterwards. Well, I was in ten. I was in the army ten years. I started as an infantry medic, and I think is one of the most important developmental periods of my life. I actually joined during a war too. It was during Vietnam. Um, but no, we can we can do better. But but let's hear about Denny's story. So you're really well trained in the infantry as a marine, and then what happens? Um, so, in January of 2007, uh, actually about one year later since from joining boot camp, um, we went to Fallujah, Iraq, and when we landed, it was uh, like a week after Saddam had just got home, so there was mm. a lot of uprising kind right. of in the area, but uh, I mean, that was my first deployment, and I remember landing in, in, the, in the country of Iraq, and I was just... I, I don't know if enthralled would be the right word. Um, scared at the same time, very curious, but also very like reclused. Um, I remember we were driving into the our base in, in Camp Fallujah is what it was, and I, I really wanted to look outside and see what was what I was getting myself into. And I remember my seniors who were there uh, the year before. You know, they knew a lot better than I did, and they were all tucked behind the armor. And I remember peeking my head over the armor to just look out at the city. And, you know, there's palm trees on fire, cars on fire, oh. buildings in pieces. It was surreal, to say the least. And uh, I remember our truck got shot by a, by a sniper. And it just, you hear the tink hit the truck. And all my seniors were like, I told you, get down. You know, a lot, a lot of different language they use. <laughs> <clears throat> so then we, we pulled into our base. And uh, we didn't really know that there was artillery, big, big guns that were right next to where we were sleeping for the for our stay in Iraq. And they immediately started firing into the city of Fallujah and the, the surrounding cities. And all my seniors hit the ground because they had no, you know, we had no clue if it was incoming or outgoing. And that was just my my first sense of what I was getting myself into. Nice welcome. Right. That's what's that? Nice welcome. That's pretty crazy. Right. I mean, I'm glad that they were sending the heat in a different direction. Um, but it was it, it was about two weeks later when I really started, we started doing the missions because you kind of got to left seat, right seat is the term where you um, learn what the, the unit that's there already has to teach you from what they've learned, right? So we, uh, we did that and within the first month on February 16th, I got hit by my first IED, that, my first bomb IED. We, we had an illumination round that hit us earlier in the, in the deployment and that was just really scary, kind of lit up the sky and it, it was on the ground, caught, you know, caught bushes on fire because they didn't know what ordinance they were putting in the ground. So that was, that was a scary experience. So that was um, kind of another welcome. And one month after that was my first IED and that it, it gave 12 of us concussions. And it, it, oh, so that's not even, that's not even the one that the story I heard about. That's a different. No, no, no. This oh, is holy cow. Yeah. And I, and I think this is really important to set it up is and tell me had you had any brain injuries before you went into the military yes so I, I grew up playing pop warner football from third grade to i mean i was one of the the best players in northern california for a tight end and defensive end my junior and senior year so i played my whole life basically football and you're a pretty big guy so right yeah Lots of high impact sports. I mean, I skateboarded and just anything you can think of where I was punishing my body is basically what I was doing growing up. It's just part of the adventure, I guess. Right. Um, yeah, no, part of our goal is to educate parents on how important it is to protect a child's brain because it just can impact the rest of your life. So, so going in, so, playing football um, and skateboard and, and so on, you could have likely had, like me, I played football, a vulnerable brain. And then as you get to Iraq, just 
So you a, already had a, a concussion, of weeks right? There, you're exposed to your first IED. Tell us what happened. Um, yeah, so we were just kind of uh, on a patrol. Well, we had some um, another unit in our area. They were under attack, and it was in the middle of the night, and they needed emergency you know they needed quick reaction force they needed to be pulled out of there quickly so we got in our trucks there was five of us or five trucks about you know 25 30 people and we took off driving down there and uh i remember we pat we passed their location by maybe 100 feet and so we began to turn around our convoy and i was in the second truck the first truck had begun to turn around and i just look over to my left out the window and I see just all the telltale signs oh. of a vehicle-borne IED. I mean, this thing was laying on the ground. The car was laying on the ground, like the axles were gone, or the shocks were gone, right? The trunk was sagging very low. There were wires hanging out. All the windows were spray-painted black. And I just looked at it, and I remember telling myself, oh, sh you know, oh, bleep, that's an IED. Oh, no. And I said IED, it exploded. And I remember just watching a piece of the bumper or something tumble out my window, and it just... I mean, it spider webbed my window right next to me, and it popped open the door on my on both the left side, both passenger and driver door. And uh, I just I remember hearing a piece of metal tinking off of all the the metal inside of our truck. All the armors are like tink 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 tink, and it lands on my seat, and I didn't realize anything of it. I'm trying to hold the doors closed because, I mean, I'm not really aware of what just happened. It kind of rocked me pretty good. Uh, everyone in the truck is kind of like, what the heck? We knew it was an ID, but it was just really crazy. And I look, when the door swung open, there was just this big burning crater. So, uh, yeah, I closed the door. I wasn't going to hop out in that. Um, we still had to pick up those guys. But we ended up telling them that they had to run back on their own because we just got two of our trucks almost disabled. And uh, we were driving back to our base and I remember sitting on this molten lava piece of metal that had been tinking around in the truck so that was uh definitely a, a, a scary experience for me and when we went to like clean out the truck from all the you know to fix the truck from what happened what ha they had uh, a piece of shrapnel had went through all of our gear and all of our water and all of our food and it stuck in the the armor it's just like this thinnest armor right behind my head less than a quarter inch of just Kevlar and it's it's just this little door so you can reach into the back, but everything else is like two inches thick of armor. So, I mean, I kept that piece of shrapnel. <laughs> wow. So you yeah. already had PTSD and brain injury like early on before the, before your really big um, explosion happened that I well, heard about. You can't say PTSD. So he had <laughs> a traumatic event which is obvious. Well, so you wouldn't call that, you would that wouldn't cause PTSD? I hadn't interpreted it badly. Yeah, no, not yet. Um, yes. And you probably had <laughs> a concussive blow with the IED being so close to when it exploded. And then, right. did you notice anything different about yourself after that first IED? So they actually took uh, all 12 of us out of the field for three days, and I do, just remember being, you know, slower. I just felt slower. My body was sore. I mean, I was just really exhausted. But I don't know if that was just from being on a very, very schedule that we were on. I mean, demanding. So uh, I, I feel like it gave me a concussion. I mean, I yeah, was... probably so. Um, it had yeah. to. It was a massive bomb. Right. <laughs> it was right next to me. There's and no way I could have dodged it. So that's in February of 2008, Seven. 2007. Seven. And then yes. what happened? Uh, so we just con kind of continued our mission. And, and like I was saying, Tana, the, um, it, I was kind of preparing for war, right, the whole year. So when I got blown up the first time, it wasn't like a, a real shock, you know, kind of comes with the territory. But the, the one that happened on April 16th was far, far worse. And so... I have to mention that the, the day before, so this is April 15th, we were, we kind of got put up in a situation where these guys were trying to hijack a car right in front of us and kind of beat up some civilians. So we kind of aggressively chased after them and shot at them. I don't know if we got any, but you know, that what happened was is the very, very next day, and this is April 15th, I mean, same day, April 15th, we went over to this house and I'd been there before and my lieutenant had asked myself and another guy in my truck to dismount and go into this house and kind of talk with the people. 
And again, I, I've seen these people before, had conversations with them on more than one occasion. And when I walked in that door, it, these guys were laying on the ground, cowering, like rear, like back on their hands and, you know, back on their elbows, just kind of like, don't hurt me. And I knew immediately, I was like, something is wrong. And so I asked for backup and I was denied backup. And so I ran back out to the truck and the very next day we were, we kind of just started our normal routine, went out on a mounted patrol, five trucks, and we all got in our vehicles. And uh, I, what we do is sweep in front of our vehicles, a big shape of a V, goes out 100 yards and up 100 yards, and it's 45 degree angle from the front bumper of, of our first truck, right? So like a big cone off the front of the truck. And uh, I'm on the front of the very left side, so I'm as farthest away from the truck as you can be, other than the right. and I'm kind of walking along and looking for wires because we trip over them. That's a way we find IEDs. And that's because during the war, while I was there, there was multiple ways to stop IEDs. We would jam them with a jammer or we would find the wires. And so whatever the situation for them was, they'd work around it essentially. And what they had done was watched us for so long that they ended up burying the wire just where right as I was about to trip over it, they sent a car racing out of our convoy and this guy pulled his e-brake out and hung his AK out the window and just started shooting at all of us. So we were called back to our truck right before we were tripping over the IE or over the wire. So, I mean, it was, and now that I look back, it's easily an, a well-planned ambush against us. So it was, it's kind of scary to think of that, but I ran back to the truck, hopped in and we took off to pursue and the first truck drove over the bomb. It didn't go off. And then my truck went over it. Oh, and it, just, it went boom. I, I, I didn't so much hear the blast as I felt it just, everything turned dark and it was brown inside of my vehicle and I felt weightless, you know, floating through the air and it, it was really crazy. And I remember telling myself long while this is going on, like, Oh my gosh, that was another IED. And the truck hit the ground and then rolled. I feel like it, but I, I'm not quite sure what happened after the first impact to the ground. I, I think I was knocked on unconscious. So I woke up to the inside of my truck was like on fire for a flash second, a couple seconds. Like that's what woke me up and my face was just, it burnt. And so disoriented, I hopped out of my truck, which at this point in time, the entire front is gone. The most of the right side is gone. The dry or the shotgun position is just gone. The right side of the armor is 50 yards off the road. The engine block with the pistons blown out was 200 yards down the road in front of us. And the, and our, the roof of our truck was pinched like a wedge. And uh, I hopped out and tried to slam my door, but the armor, it was just like a, I don't know, a muscle, muscle memory. I'm trying to close the door. I remember focusing on that for quite a bit of time. <laughs> and then I see my buddy right next to me and he's, uh, he's just hanging out the truck. And I knew that I needed to help him. I ran around the truck once and kind of triaged the scene. And then I, I went to pull out my, my buddy who was the gunner. He was standing up next to me, but now he's laying out the driver's door with, and he's in between the legs of our driver, which is one stuck up by his head and the other one's pinned down below the steering wheel. And the driver's stuck in the roof above my seat. So I, I don't know if that is an explanation that you can visualize, but my gunner was trapped in the radio mount. When the transmission came through the floorboard, it wrapped this aluminum radio mount that held two radios. It wrapped his ankles inside of it, and that kept him in the vehicle as we were <clears throat> rolling around and tumbling. And so his legs, his ankles up to his femurs were, were just shattered, and his lower back was broken. And at that point in time, I seen the guy that was sitting next to me. He was about 50 yards um, in, in front of me, and I'm staring at the, the vehicle perpendicular to me. And so I'm looking through where the passenger seat would be, the shotgun seat, and I see him just laying in a big puddle of his own blood in the middle of the road. And I, I told the guy I was trying to treat that I couldn't pull him out. And I ran over to help him, and that's when uh, the rest of my guys showed up. And so I just frantically started searching for a gun because mine was in pieces. And uh, I went into a cover, and one of my friends came over, and he helped me kind of patch up my wounds. And I had shrapnel on my face, and I had burns on my face, second-degree burns on my face. I mean, shrapnel on my neck. I had holes in my right and left leg. I broke my ankle. And then the, the concussion. Um, so finally got 
got treated or got some first aid on there and then some helicopters landed. And during this time, I had to kind of direct my platoon as they ran up. I didn't have to, but I just knew what the scene looked like. So I remember my guys running up and asking where our lieutenant was, and I, I had to keep emphasizing that he was gone, you know, and they wanted to still see his body. So I pointed them in the direction, but I, I made sure that the imperative was to get, you know, this gunner who's stuck, get the driver out who's bleeding out, get the guy that was sitting next to me because he's got a massive head, head wound. You know, they, they took precedence at that moment. Um, and then, so the healing process from that, I went, I mean, straight into surgery and it was excruciating. They had to dig out shrapnel and I mean, willow br or wire brush my face to get oh, all the, God. get all the, you know, all the burns and debris off. And then, uh, from there I went off to Qatar and this is, I wasn't even 21, by the way, I'm, I'm 19 getting ready to turn 20 and I turned 20 in Qatar and so yeah, on May 18th, so a year, I mean, a month after I was wounded, I was still healing in Qatar. And then uh, they sent me back to Fallujah and I I wasn't ready for it. And so I went, ended up going home and just, I didn't really recover quite like I wanted to. Um, I was just given a, an excessive amount of meds essentially. And, and it was a struggle from there. I mean, but I- When did you go back to Fallujah? It was June, June of 07, that same year. Yeah. So I, okay. I went and healed for a little while after being wounded and then. And did you go back to doing the same job? Uh, so that was, that injury ended up getting me medically separated from the Marine Corps on a, a med board. So I got, I got like a severance package. And a, so in yeah. June, when you went back to Fallujah that you then got a medical board and then were, Oh, I mean, I, I began the process. Yeah. So I had to get out of the country and that I just, uh, I wasn't in the right mindset and I didn't feel a hundred percent. And I, I couldn't justify it to my buddies. Like I was like, Hey, I, I want to come out there with you, but I don't feel a hundred percent. And that could get one of you killed or me killed. And I, I just can't, like, it's not something I was willing to risk. So, ha, so who died in the vehicle? Uh, First Lieutenant Sean Blue, Lance Corporal Jesse Delatory. Both of them died. Yes. And then so when I flew back to Fallujah, they put, they kind of had me do some mundane duties like radio watch in the command center. And uh, my very first day in Fallujah, very first day back seeing my unit after being separated from them for a while. And I'm sitting in there on radio watch. And the first thing that happens to me is my my platoon's taking contact and i hear right over the net that we had a, a kia already and he's not even just from my platoon but he's from my squad so he was shot in the head by a sniper and he was killed right so i was supposed to go from i was supposed to go from that radio or from that duty radio watch to my psychologist right but that was in within my radio watch i hear this and so my with the XO, the executive officer, kind of like the second dude in charge in the in the COC, he, he comes over to me and he goes, hey, Lance Corporal Salisbury, just so you know, uh, Lance Corporal Strong was just shot and killed by a sniper. So if you hear any rumors, um, you just, you know the answer, all right? He's all, you can go see your buddy before you go to your psych appointment, right? And so this guy that I'm going to see was one of my, he was one of the most motivational Marines that I ever met. He had trained me to be who I was. I mean, he was a really good person, but he had gotten sick. And so I was supposed to go over there, but not tell him that his friend just got killed. And so I had to go in there and I remember just like, I was crying like crazy. And I just, I felt bad because I wasn't so much crying to see him. I was crying because I couldn't tell him that our friend just got killed. And it was really a screwed up situation. So I went to see the psych and I was like, I can't, I can't be here right now. So I'm just you know, not right in my head. And I, I used a couple choice words and sayings, and um, I guess they ended up sending me home. But yeah, that was. Wow. Wow. So what happened then? Um, so I went, I came back to the US and- uh, And what and month then, is that? That was, uh, so I got back July 1st, of 2007. Okay. And so on July 1st, 
I remember I was able to request leave and I went home. And, I mean, right off the bat, there was some drama that happened at home. So it was just. So you walked went, right into challenges, which wasn't helpful, probably. No, and straight. I mean, yeah, right when I got home, the very first thing I see is this this dude, this guy just punches a girl and knocks her out right in front of me. And I was like, what? Uh, I mean, what is, this is not what I just fought for. I, ser- I was seriously disturbed. And I remember telling people, like, they were asking what's wrong, you know, because I had bandages on and I was in crutches. They were like, what's wrong with you? And I said that I was I was hurt in Iraq. And they said, oh, really? Was it a car wreck or a motorcycle wreck? Oh, my and God. The level of ignorance that I, I came home to was very disgusting. It was like, I mean, and at that time, there's, you know, all these sports games on and people just had this disconnect from the reality that we're over there fighting and dying. And there was... And there was all this fake thank yous, you know, thank you for your service. Not saying that all of them are fake, but there was a, kind of like a false support. So it had to, I mean, I, I can only assume it probably had to feel to you like, why was I there? Like, why did I risk my life and almost lose my life? And two of my buddies lost their lives or three of them or however many of them, tons of them. Right. Why, why did I do this? Yeah, that's been the, that has been a question I'm sure that's haunted quite a few people. I mean... Uh, at the same time, you know, I, I, I don't want to be negative about the military. I mean, the Marines, the Army, they, that experience, those people that, that I met and lived with were the greatest people I've ever met and will ever meet. No, and a lot of us sincerely do consider, I mean, I, I feel safer because I know a lot of people agree with me, you know, police officers, soldiers. We sleep better at night because we know there are people out there who do that job. Um, it's, it's a necessary thing. It's just got to feel to those of you who experienced what you experienced. Um, like, why did I do it? We certainly feel like they could do a better job of supporting, um, you know, our heroes. Well, well, it was an ambivalent war. Right. Like Vietnam was an ambivalent. I didn't know why we were there. Right. I mean, it was an ambivalent war. I mean, nobody felt threatened because of the Vietnamese in Southeast Asia and nobody felt threatened by Saddam Hussein in California, right? But, you know, because of the political powers that be and as soldiers, you know, as an infantry medic and as an infantry Marine, that's sort of not our job, right? Right. Our job is to do what we're told and, and we do. But when you come home, whether from Vietnam or from Iraq, and people don't really understand, they don't get it, um, right. it's, it's hard. And you ask yourself the question, why, why did that happen? But, but tell us quickly, and then um, we're, we're going to go on to uh, the scan and we're going to go on to healing. Uh, right. Tell us, tell us um, quickly over the next 10 years, what happened? So actually I got to the point where I was on so much medication and uh, at that time, you know, I'm having a daughter that's being born and I have a a wife that isn't so much what we were right for each other kind of a thing. Uh, So it it was, I I was in a very, very bad state. I mean, I wanted to die every day. I felt like I wanted to die every day. I was on so many medications and just, no hope, spending all my money. It just, it wasn't what I wanted. And I knew it, but I couldn't do anything about it. It was so hard to to come off those medications just by yourself. It's deadly even. And I remember going to the VA and I, I was begging them for help. Every day I was taking an excessive amount of medications and I just wanted again to die. And I got to the point where I really did. I tried to kill myself. I wanted to shoot myself in the head. And when I squeezed my trigger, the, the gun did not go off. So I was oh, wow. extremely fortunate. But you know what? At the same time, I may have uh, subconsciously not loaded it. It had a magazine in it, but there was the bullet in the chamber did not fire. So I mean, wow. I, uh, so I went straight to the VA and to my psychologist and I was like, I really need help right now or I'm going to die. I, I'm going to die. And I remember, swear to God, I got on my hands and knees and I begged her. I was like, please help me. And I'm crying tears of freaking pouring out of my face. And they kind of just didn't do anything. And for, for two months, I'm sitting there begging for my life, it felt like. 
and I'm asking for them to put me in a program and I'm looking for programs on my own. And finally, I just got to the point where I advocated for myself, even though I'm in a delirium, I'm, I'm almost unconscious every day from all the meds. I just knew that I had to be in a better place. And, uh, I ended up, I was so desperate that I ended up going to um, this rehab center that's in uh, downtown San Francisco. It's in like one of the most ghetto parts of San Francisco. I mean, you can hear gunshots when you're in that place. You can hear them outside and the people that are coming off the, sh off the streets with drug habit, or, you know, addiction, and they're trying to suffer through their withdrawals under a roof, you know, so and they all have scabies and bed bugs and it's just, ugh. but I was so desperate to get clean that I went in there and just, I suffered through two weeks of it. of just wow. sheer agony of, because in order for me to go to this program at Menlo Park, I knew that I wanted to go there clean and sober. And after I voiced that concern, they made sure that I couldn't get in there unless I was clean or sober. And um, finally they, I was able to get, get healed from that or not even healed. I, I, I had to leave that, that rehab center because it was just so much, too much for me. Um, but I went home and just suffered the other two weeks just on my own. And was and, this prescription medication or was this other kinds of uh, This was drugs? all prescription. I didn't, I, I didn't do street drugs. I just, uh, prescriptions that were given to me through the military, through the VA, I was just, there was no regulation so much. So I was just able to keep asking for more and more and higher. Yeah. Amounts. One statistic, my friend, Colonel Daniel Johnston, uh, told me the more prescription medications veterans are on, the more likely they are to kill themselves. <laughs> Crazy. Well, it makes sense. So I that. yeah. I was on 15 wow. at, at, at the highest point. Yeah. So, oh, wow. Um, and I'm talking, I'm not even 21 at that time, you know, I'm 15 medications, like, give me a break. I mean, I share that. Right. Horror. But that's what traditional medicine does. It's you have a symptom, they give you a drug, right. they get, you know, you and have a side effect, they give you a drug for the side effect. And they're all disconnected. And when did you go into the program in Menlo Park? That was, uh, I want to say sometime in 2012, maybe like August. Okay. And you and found that to be really helpful for you, correct? It was. It was a three-month inpatient program, and uh, in the last month, their focus is on trauma therapy to, you know, kind of dissect your trauma. They take you all the way back to where it started, and you look at it from multiple perspectives, and it kind of helps you understand where where problematic thinking arises from. That's awesome. I, I thought it was very helpful. And they also taught communication skills and coping skills and anger management. And at the same time, wow. there was a cycling program within that. And I definitely got, I was like, oh, I'll do it. You know, I'll try the spandex. I'll, <laughs> I'll keep in, you know. I was super, uh, you know, I, I was biased against wearing spandex at the time. <laughs> but it, it's funny because it, you know, it's really helpful for those. Sort cyclists. of like you and minivans. Yeah, me and Minivan. I won't drive a Minivan, yes. <laughs> so I, uh, and I won't wear pink lace. I started all right, exploring. so that was super helpful. All right, so now people have sort of a context for what happened to you and the war that you were still in when you came home. Uh, right. So the war really never left, and in fact, it accelerated and got Work. So I don't know if you saw before we just end this, um, Chloe and I recently watched the movie Thank You for Your Service, and it was so sad, but it did a really good job of talking about how when these guys come home, the different perspectives, one guy just wants to go back, wants to go back, but he can't, you know, one guy is like you, desperate, he suffered so much over there, and he's desperately begging them to help him, can't get the help he needs, and the VA is pretty much just overwhelmed. And they can't, they just can't do well, a good job. they don't have the right model. They don't. They, and they so, don't have the, so how many people in your recovery since you came home from Iraq looked at your brain and taught you how to rehabilitate it? I don't think anybody looked at my brain. Maybe when I was in Camp Pendleton, I got a brain scan and I was able to do some, oh, I can't think. Some some sort of therapy for that, but I don't think they really grasped how, how bad or what direction it was. Versus, I mean, either it was a PTSD or TBI. You know, they they didn't calculate it down to the way that your scan has done it. What you have told me. So when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about how you and Danny met, 
and then your visit to the clinic and what you learned and what happened then. Stay with us. All right, welcome back. Uh, we are with Denny Salisbury talking about Iraq and IEDs Hard and story. Uh, multiple psychiatric medications. And uh, so Tana meets Denny on a survival weekend, which, as she said, I was ambivalent about. To he wasn't start. ambivalent. He was clear. I was in the army for ten years. I did. He was an, clear. He was not going. I did enough going. survival. Uh, he he looks at me. He goes, "Do I not take good care of you? Do I not put a really nice roof over your? Why are you going to go sleep out in the, in the wilderness?" Anyways, she was so excited when she met you and thought our work could be helpful, so she invited you to the clinic, um, what was that like for you? So before, I mean. Well, he probably, I kinda... Let me back up for one second. Cause he probably thought I was a crazy lady. Cause I hear his story and I'm like trying to tell him, Hey, this is what we do. Like I'm like, I jump in like my maternal kind of way that I do. And he probably thinks I'm psychotic. Um, so, and I'm trying to tell him what we do and then I'm reaching out to him and he's probably like, who is this crazy person? You know, so, I mean, the whole way that it came up was probably a little intense for him. I'm suspecting because I can be intense. Really? A little bit. So I'm going to guess no that it probably was a little weird for you, knowing me, which I don't try to be, but I am um, a little intense. So tell us from there, like what you were thinking and then how you came here. I like to emphasize when I teach that uh, everyone has something to teach. You know, you can learn from everyone. It doesn't matter if you're the instructor. And so when I tell my story, that's kind of like my hopes is to entice people to maybe share their story with others within the, the class, you know, explain to them even why they were there or why they're excited about being in a class about wilderness survival. So to hear you come up and talk to me, I mean, it was awesome because it was about a topic that I was passionate about. You know, I enjoy it. I enjoy understanding about my injuries so that I can overcome them better. See, not everyone yeah. thinks I'm crazy. Okay, good. Go on. <laughs> and uh, what did you think when you were coming to the clinic to get scanned? So I was nervous, obviously, driving. I mean, before, because I had no idea what to expect. Um, and then we finally, it took us three hours to get there from Ventura, so I had yeah. a lot of time to think about it. <laughs> and it was... It was nerve wracking. And then I, I show up and it's just this really nice facility. And I kind of, again, didn't know what to expect. I've never had some radio radioactive dye put in my blood before. So well, and if I could, if I could jump in, because when I meet Denny and we're out in the field with this wilderness survival, he's really bright, really confident, really on his game. He's like got everything under control. And so when you come into the clinic, he was nervous. Like he was, <laughs> he was voiced being nervous. He's like, I'm nervous about seeing my brain. And I'm thinking, man, this is this like really tough Marine who like had everything under control and now he's nervous, but that's not an abnormal but he got blown thing. Up. Right. This is not <laughs> my point that I'd I want to make. Nervous too. Wait, the point I want to make is it's not abnormal. I'm a trauma nurse and I'm used to having things under control and I was nervous, but, and that's not an abnormal thing for people to go through. So just, I just want to like paint that picture. He's like, I, I don't know what I'm going to see. And it makes me a little uncomfortable. Okay. So, so you were nervous and then we went over your scan. Now the holes, um, he does not have any holes in his brain, but what he had was very significant decreased activity in his frontal lobes. So that's, a, um, that's decreased blood flow, right? From probably from the flow. blast injuries. Very decreased activity in his left occipital lobe. Um, and so that's what we call a coup contra That's from the blast, right? injury where the front part gets hit and it'll slam the brain against the back part of the like skull. Like shaken baby. So like shaken baby where you see damage in both. And so even though he's done a great job at his own recovery. More better than most. That there is significant healing that can still occur. And 
And uh, so I showed you, well, here is what it is now, and it's clearly hurt, but here is the potential for healing. And that always gets me excited. So when you left after you saw your scan, what was going on in your mind? So before you showed me what what was wrong and how to improve it, I was still, you know, I still had to go through the, the testing that you guys had. And I remember just being almost like angry at myself because I could see myself choosing the wrong answer every time. Like before I click the button, it's like, I'm, oh, that's wrong. And I still press the button. And but. So, I mean, again, still nerve wracking, but then when I, when you showed me that how I can improve it, that's once, that's when it started like settling down for me. I, I seen that there was a path to getting better and that's kind of been something I've been trying to do my, since Iraq really, it's just find the, the problem, understand how to make the solution and then continue with the path. And that's, that's basically how I, I viewed it for the entire trip back. And since, I mean, once you showed me that, I, I just see that there's a way to to recover and I, I enjoy that. Well, and I got a really cool text from you. I wasn't expecting it as quickly as, as I got the text from you um, about a week afterwards. And you said it's, after only a week, you were starting to feel better. You felt more hopeful and more positive um, that you noticed your energy was a little better and that you, um, you, had, you, know, you had more energy to go outside and do things with your daughter um, and that you were excited because you had a plan. So yeah. that's what we love. Usually we get that a couple weeks later and that was a week after you had been here. So how long did it take before you really started to, to feel so pretty what good we, about it? What we did just to, so we put you on uh, a group of supplements, multiple vitamin, high dose fish oil, brain boost, and then something to really help with focus and energy. So I really wanted to significantly increase the blood flow in your brain. And given your experience with medication, that's really not where I wanted to go. I wanted, you know, can we do this naturally? And this is, it's the same protocol we used with our NFL players. So we've scanned and treated 200 uh, or more now NFL players. Their brains actually look very similar to your brain because, you know, they have thousands of subconcussive blows. Um, and so I was really confident we could make a big difference in your life. And and you've been really cooperative from what I understand. I mean, that's often what it, what it takes. It's give your brain the nutrition it needs, stop doing anything that hurts your brain, and uh, let the healing accelerate, let it begin. I have, right. a, and I have a couple questions. So in our last segment, you guys brought up a couple of things and I think it's sort of relevant here and I want you to sort of talk about it because looking at his scan, you know, you actually published a huge study where you could see the difference between PTSD and traumatic brain injury. Okay. So listening to your story, I'm, I'm shocked. I'm astounded, but yet we hear it all the time that number one, the military doesn't have a better way of assessing these, these poor kids, their kids, before they put them back out in the field. I, I'm just stunned by that. But it sounded to me like they did not assess well, okay? He had a massive brain injury and they did not assess that well, okay? He also had, I when I early on in the segment said, oh wow, when he first got there a month later, he had PTSD and a brain injury before he even had his big blast injury. And you're like, wait, wait, no, he didn't. I don't understand the difference because I'm thinking an IED goes off, there's a crater next to me and, and everyone and 12 people in my car get a concussion. For me, that's PTSD, okay? So, well, but, so help but, me but out this here. This is really important. Not everybody who's exposed to a trauma develops post-traumatic stress disorder. So if you think of a bell-shaped curve, 10% of people exposed to a trauma will end up with a long-standing PTSD. Oh, okay. But 80% will not. And 10% of people will actually develop this thing we call post-traumatic So this is interesting. Growth. This is important. And, and so we can't just say because he experienced something bad um, that he had PTSD. You can't do that. After the second blast where your friends, you know, died. friends are dying and you know you know and it sounded clear you had ptsd and you had the effects of traumatic brain injury um and when i looked at your scan you obviously had the 
a traumatic brain injury, no question in my mind at, at all. Um, but you also have PTSD. And I published uh, uh, two studies actually on veterans and then a large one on 21,000 people showing what we can separate. Is this PTSD or TBI or is it both? And it's very clear you had both and people using the tools they had, they, they tried to help you, which ultimately hurt you. And th there's just such a better way to do this. Right. Um, and, and the VA has such inertia. It's just, it makes me crazy because I've actually been to the highest levels of the VA going, this is a better way to do it. And they go, oh, that's really interesting. And then nothing happens. And it's, uh, it's a scandal in my mind. We could be doing better and we're not doing better. And it's because people aren't making smart decisions. But, but that's not why we're here today. Where we're here today is to talk about you. And the, the scan sounds like motivated you, gave you information and hope. And since then, you've taken the supplements. What else have you done to help your brain? So I'm trying to get back to fitness, uh, especially with this surgery on my shoulder. It's just been yeah, kind it's of, hard. Uh, stagnant. Uh, I have, I mean, I, I'm trying to regain that motivation because uh, I know that, I mean, I got a hopeful future and I want to spend a lot more time doing what I love, which involves a lot of wilderness training and, and teaching. So I know that I have to get back to that point. I, in order to give back, I need to be able to help myself. And it's uh, interesting that you guys talked about the PTSD because what the, it's similar to what they taught at Menlo Park through Stanford, which was put on by the VA. They basically said that, and I agree with them, right, that trauma can happen to anybody, right? Your interpretation is is whether or not you have PTSD. Oh. If you grew up in a, if you grow up in say, you know, your childhood's wonderful and nice, and you experience something that's crazy and bad, that right there can give you trauma, and vice versa. If you grow up living a terrible you know, exist into the beginning and then you experience something nice that you've never seen before, that too can give you trauma. People that, you know, have it neutral, a little bit of both that are able to overcome it the best. And uh, maybe that's how I had it. Because uh, the PTSD has not been so much of an issue as the TBI for me. I feel like Menlo helped me really recover from the PTSD. I, I interpreted it and understood what it was wrong, what it was that was wrong with me. So, I mean, just like that, just like the brain scan, that's how I feel, right? I see the answer to my TBI, whereas I've seen the answer to my PTSD before. And it's exciting, very exciting. And I know that I have to work hard to get back on track. And nutrients and being healthy and eating right is obviously key to that. I mean, along with exercise, like you said, and you had a number of other insults that people usually don't consider insults. So how many times have you had general anesthesia? Oh, man, seven. Yeah. And general anesthesia is not good for your brain. And so just coming out of the sh shoulder surgery, it just means, okay, that's an insult. I just need to keep doing the right things to put my brain in a healing environment and your right. brain can then heal from it. But if you eat bad food, if you don't sleep, if you are not exercising, you're under chronic stress, you believe every stupid thought you think, then all of those things put your brain into a toxic environment and then it prevents healing. And right. so by doing the right thing every day, when we do your follow-up scan, which you know we should do fairly soon, um, Odds are we're going to see it much better. We're going to celebrate that. And for the rest of your life, because you, your brain has been hurt, you want to be on a brain healthy program. And ultimately, that will allow you to be the best teacher, the best partner, the best father. Um, but it starts with loving and rehabilitating your brain. And so it's got to be a lifelong commitment to loving and rehabilitating your brain. Right. I'm just curious, Denny, did they teach you meditation? They did, but I, at that time, I wasn't really in the mindset to begin meditation. It's definitely something I'm looking for. I would like to try, you know, pursue in the future. So on Brain yeah. Fit Life, we have an online community. If we've not given you access to it, we should. 
brainfedlife.com. Um, there's actually meditation audios, mm -hmm. brain enhancing they music. They help you if you're not used to it. There are hypnosis audios for things like pain and sleep and relaxation. All of those things are natural, right? You're not going to have any side effects from them. But putting them as ways to decrease stress can be really helpful. Did I talk to you about hyperbaric oxygen? You did. You said that was one of the best ways to get. Yeah. So if that's something you can do, um, you know, at home or near your home, that would be a great thing to help us accelerate healing for right. your brain. So I have definitely kept that in mind. I've uh, asked a few people that's about it. I haven't, it's on the top of my list for healing my brain. That's for sure. Um, it's just, unfortunately at the moment I had to, I've had to focus on my shoulders. Yeah. So I, I mean, there's a lot going on for me. I just got to stay in the, be present and be aware that there is a path for my healing. I mean, if I lose track of that, that's when I slip into the, the hole of PTSD and, and start having the, the issues that so many veterans are experiencing. And so that's, it's just being active and aware of it all the time. I, I'm the same way. Activity for me is critical. Um, I think some of us, for some of us, um, exercise is medicine. Um, for me, it is certainly medicine, but I will tell you, cause there've been times in my life when I have not been able to be active and it, it really gets to me. Um, meditation is like medicine as well. And so when I can't be active is when I really focus on meditating. So if you're not able to meditate on your own yet, cause you're not used to it, sometimes those guided meditations, like what Daniel was talking about can be very, very helpful. And I even have a couple I can send you that I've actually done for my community too. Yeah, so. no, you should do that. And I on, like that. Absolutely. Yeah. on brain fit life, there's a guided one. So all you have to do is do it with me call the loving kindness meditations very Simple. powerful and but great yeah and actually has been shown to help with people who have ptsd yeah so so that can be really great all right well we should plan in a month or so um or whenever you feel like okay i'm I'm back from the surgery and i've you've been on the supplements consistently for three months um you should come back and we should scan you. And and this the scan probably going to be better. Whatever it is is good news cuz you know, we're going to see what you have and and then we'll make more recommendations to try to continue to heal and optimize your brain. And we need to do um, something on post traumatic growth and and how to how people can turn their PTSD into post traumatic growth. Well, and some of the things, Danny, I want you to think about um, since you've experienced this. So there are five areas of post-traumatic growth, um, a new appreciation of life that I'm alive, uh, that I survived as opposed to the guilt that I didn't, that I survived and other people didn't. Um, how you relate to others, uh, which is different than before, your personal strength, new possibilities, and spiritual growth. Uh, so those are areas I we do can all talk about. Maybe that's why I don't focus on... You do all of those from your traumatic childhood. And do you know what's interesting? I don't know if you ever experienced this, Denny, um, because I hate, I hate the idea of being a victim to anything or the idea, like I hate it so much. Um, which is why I sort of like that warrior metaphor for my life. And I focus on martial arts and things that are empowering. And notice that when, like when, whenever someone has a message that is sort of puts you in a victim, like we went to church recently and the message was on sexual abuse, but they kept focusing on making women victims. And I got so upset and my head started to hurt. And I think it's because I've spent so much time focusing on not being a victim to it, on turning it around and making it something that I've grown from that you can't sort of tolerate being a victim anymore. Um, right. So it's really important. Do you yeah, know? That's like the glass half empty or glass half full kind of a people, you know, you, you can either be a victim or you can be a survivor. Yeah. And, or a warrior. Well, and by you right. teaching survival training, I mean, I just think that's a very Perfect. special metaphor. And you're good um, at it. Well, that's one of the reasons you fell in love with him. Yep. All right. So stay tuned. You're listening to the Brain Warriors Way Thanks so much, podcast. Denny. And we will have Denny on again. Thank, Thank you, you, my friend. Thank you for listening Thank to you. the Brain Warriors Way podcast. 
go to iTunes and leave a review and you'll automatically be entered into a drawing to get a free signed copy of The Brain Warrior's Way and The Brain Warrior's Way Cookbook we give away every month.